Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome once again to another episode of the Dan Bancaro Show, only on YouTube. I'm your host, yes, and a major league piece of work, and a spaghetti with meat sauce for breakfast, abusing son of a gun, Dan Bancaro. So, hey, I want to apologize to all of my uh, loyal viewers and some of my new viewers uh, for the month-long hiatus that I took. I've been extremely uh, tied up with uh, some work-related stuff, some type of other com type of uh, recovery commitments. Uh, yeah, I got to go to the Warriors game a couple weeks ago. I got to see the Warriors uh, barely get by the Sacramento Queens, 124 to 122. Got to go to the uh, to the game with my parents for the first time. That was kind of fun. Even more uh, exciting was I got to run into the great Gino Chandri uh, at the game. It's always good to see him. It's been a few years and. Uh, some bitch still looks the same. He's doing great. What a nice guy, man. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, I've been tied up. Yeah, I, 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 then I, I hit uh, one year of sobriety uh, in a row. It only took me 10 years. And uh, my friends had a nice party uh, over at San Mateo Central Park. Even in the uh, cloudy, gloomy, and rainy weather, we still were able to draw about 65 to 70 people. That was really great. Uh, I, uh, it's probably one of the most memorable days of my life. Uh, only exception might be uh, the birth of Stella in 2009, that day, man. I'll never forget that. But, uh, yeah, so it's been a great month. You know, I, I decided to wait on uh, 2012 Part 3 and uh, do that as a prequel later on. And I just kind of want to jump right into 2013 again, get back into the mess a little bit more and the disaster and uh, what I was going through. Uh, so yeah, so I completed the uh, Salvation Army Adult Rehabilitation uh, Center program on Valencia Street in San Francisco in March of 2013. It was actually one of the most challenging things I've ever accomplished. It was not easy. A lot of the times I felt very out of the place based on the backgrounds of some of the guys I was in this uh, facility with. There's uh, about 110 guys and most of them were serving uh, some type of uh, jail requirements or prison requirements. And they're sent there by the legal system. But uh, through some type of uh, diligence and a little bit of luck, I finished. Uh, I don't necessarily believe I deserve to have completed the program. But I'll get back to that in 2012 and at a later date. I remember that day I completed a, my, uh, my parents and my Aunt Kathy and Uncle Bill, along with my friends Kenny Wardell and Ken Cattell, showed up. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, they came to the ceremony that day. And... Uh, yeah, I delivered the speech that didn't go over very well with the staff, and quite frankly, it didn't include much humility in it, And uh, but it was revered by most of the uh, clients, but not all, uh, that were enrolled in the program, and uh, some of his graduates were in attendance. They, they thoroughly enjoyed it, for the most part. I, uh, I then stayed an additional month, uh, and I began working in San Francisco. I remember a couple weeks in, I my completion certificate in my backpack, and I was going to mail a copy of it to my uh, probation officer and send a copy to uh, the courts in regards to my custody case with my, uh, my daughter Stella there. And I remember I had just received my tax return for 2012, uh, a few days prior, and just gotten deposited in my account. And uh, I, you know, I, I was really, I don't know, I was just like so burnt out over the whole, the whole program and, and, and the intense labor and, and just everything that went along with it. And uh, one day I just went out and uh, yeah, I, I had made a conscious decision to go have a couple drinks and head over to the uh, Mitchell Brothers Strip Tease Parlor over off of Van Ness to have a day to myself. Uh, but I was gonna make sure that I'd stop drinking on time to, to pass the breathalyzer in order to get back in the facility later on that day and uh, go to bed. So after blowing over $400 that afternoon on lap dances and sexual favors, I fumbled around the city, continuing to uh, carouse around the Mission District, and uh, I remember I ran into a street hooker who talked me into her services, and after she took my cash, we went into her office, otherwise known as the uh, stall in the men's room at the McDonald's on uh, Mission Street. Uh, things didn't quite work out, uh, and uh, the manager chased us out uh, of the restaurant during the transaction. She offered me an IOU. Uh, anyway. I would eventually continue to drink and I'd pass out on a muni bus later, lose my backpack with my completion certificate, and I ended up at the San Francisco Transit Center 
on Beale Street later on that afternoon. So I, I made it home on time and I was able to pass the breathalyzer later on that evening. But uh, not such a good day. Not such a good day. So <clears throat> I took a job at the Rainforest Cafe as a server. And uh, I also took another job as a banquet server with a staffing company called Total Success. And uh, another one called uh, The Party Stop. So I had three little gigs going. And that would uh, send me to all these different venues in San Francisco. I would work at uh, what was then called AT&T Park, Fort Mason, the Palace of Fine Arts, San Francisco City Hall, uh, Hornblower Lots and Cruises. Uh, I'd do that on the bay at some banquets. Uh, many tall skyscraper buildings in the financial district for uh, numerous companies and banks. I remember uh, Stella had a swim lesson on one Thursday afternoon and Sean invited me to attend. So I uh, was all excited. I took BART and Sam Trans downtown in San Mateo. And I remember I got off the BART train at Millbrae. And I was wearing these earrings that day and uh, they're were, they were kind of like bothering me. And you know, they were cheap earrings, like five bucks or some stuff. This why I get a little character going with my uh, handsome regal bald head. And uh, I took them out and I threw them down the street and I proclaimed, I'm a man now. It's time for me to be a dad and not a boy. So anyway, later on I arrived at their home and Sean was getting Stella ready and uh, she requested I took a breathalyzer test. Now, I felt like, you know, I've been in this program for, you know, eight months total and jumping through hoops. You know, I felt entitled to just having a nice, simple visit. So I reacted in not a very diplomatic way. I uh, referred to her in some uh, profane names and I basically stormed out, told her I was going to start uh, exercising my parental rights. You know, th there was no orders uh, necessary for me to do these breathalyzers, and I, I, I didn't feel like, like it was, it was uh, required. So I, I'd been sore about it, and um, I was angry. I stormed out, and then I came back, and I opened up the, 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 the uh, gate there, or the, the screen door, and came in and said some more uh, vulgar things to her uh, as a result. And uh, I was just bent out of shape, but really, deep down, I just wasn't really happy with what was going on. And... Uh, that just triggered me, and I reacted in a way that uh, wasn't very good. I, I should have just taken the breathalyzer, you see, but the human ego, when we feel we're right and we've been doing what's right, and uh, if we're not aligned with any type of acceptance, tolerance, patience, love, and all that, sometimes we as human beings will overreact and, you know, they say hurt people hurt people. And that's the situation we had. So looking back, I probably just taken, should have just taken the breathalyzer and, and called it a day, but I wanted to stick my chest out and, and uh, you know, express how uh, I was being wronged again and treated like a child and I was tired of it. I remember I called her mother up and I told Shauna's mother that I was going to be you know, calling the police to enforce the uh, visitations. And, you know, there was a, some unnecessary responses there that I'm not going to get into. Um, you know, and I just... Uh, he was not friendly, and uh, the truth eventually came out a few years later, and uh, I just wasn't patient enough to wait for that truth to come out. I wanted it to all come out immediately on my time, and uh, you know, my ego wanted to win, and I wanted to exercise my rights. And uh, like I said, this is this shows uh, about me and my actions, not others. And uh, what was said on their part, which was false, uh, is not going to be uh, revealed here on this show. And uh, I was not open-minded. Uh, I wasn't patient. There was no love. There's no tolerance. I wanted my way, and I was tired of taking the back seat and letting the, uh, these things happen to me that were unjust. And uh, unfortunately, my approach wasn't successful. And that's all it comes down to. You know, Bob Anderson talks about this in the Mind Power Disease, the book that I've quoted over the uh, previous episodes. So on page 51. He says, when I show resentment, fear, anger, hostility, or when I look at the world and question it, pick on it, find fault with it, it becomes obvious that the power of self. That is what it is. It's the power of self. He continues on on page 53. He says, the open mind will give me sanity, soundness of mind, wholeness of mind, wellness of mind, because there will be something besides myself occupying me. That is the program of recovery. So again... Yeah, I went to an institution. Yeah, I was, for the most part, absent for a great period of time. But the character wasn't changing. I was still entitled. I was still resentful. I was still full of fear. I was feeling inadequate. And as a result, I suffered the consequences. 2013 
was brutal. So on like my third week, I came home to the center after an AA meeting and I blew into the uh, breathalyzer and it registered a .02. So I was asked to leave and it was on the street real quick. I took a bus and then I took, uh, I'm sorry, I took a bar train and then I took the bus down to Ken's house and he let me stay there uh, with his family for about a week until I was trying to get my act together. I was going back and forth from San Carlos to San Francisco at the Fisherman's Wharf to get to the Rainforest Cafe. And I would continue to drink slightly out of self-pity, uh, remorse, and embarrassment. And I didn't quite, uh, it didn't quite turn too bad at the time, but eventually I had to move back in with Anthony Galou. He offered me to come back and stay at his place again. Um, you know, I just, again, I, I was just so obsessed with what was wrong about everything else. And I, I couldn't apply those principles that would change my surroundings the way I looked at things. And, uh... It was, gonna about, it was about to get worse. Check this out. So, I remember I was gone all morning from uh, until the late evenings, and I'd taken a job at Applebee's that was uh, having its grand opening uh, at the Fisherman's Wharf down the street from the Rainforest Cafe. So I was working those two gigs, and you know, if I needed to fill in somewhere else, I'd go work at the party staff at these other places, like uh, at the banquets and stuff. And I'd take the F-Line from Noe Valley to the wharf every day and try to fit some groups in uh, for my recovery on my time off uh, but even even living in San Francisco take public transportation man it sometimes it's taking me an hour to get from point A to point B it was, it was rough it was the pr prime time of the uh, uh, people visiting from other countries and out of, out of the state and all these tourists around and you know the weather was nice it was torture man these, these trains were packed all, all the time so you know I became a regular over at the uh, gold dust lounge right there and uh, at the saloon yeah I come in and you know, I'd have a doers and soda or I'd have a margarita and I'd go to work or I'd get, if I wanted to save some money I'd go over to 7-eleven on the corner there and I'd buy a couple of those little bottles of the Sutter home wine have a couple pops before I go in for my shifts and I remember I'd sit there with the seagulls on this bench just feeling all pathetic and lonely and trying to try to enjoy the beautiful scenery of Alcatraz and the bay and Angel Island and all that and uh, I was trying to get some serenity but Again, there's no prayer. There's no plea for help. And if there was any pleas for help, it didn't have anything to, in regards to me and my character. It had, in, it had to do with the regards of outside circumstances, results, achievements, people's intentions towards me. Very little directed on how I was going to conduct myself. So um, I did get some killer edible brownies though from this one guy one day, one day at that gold saloon that really rocked my world. It was probably the best $10 I ever spent. That's another story. Anyway, so uh, one night after a shift, I went to the rain I was at the Rainforest Cafe, and I went out with the staff, and we went out drinking on the sports bar on Columbus Avenue. Um, and uh, I, I blacked out at some point, and I made it home, and I came to, and I don't think Anthony was there for a couple days. And so I went to work the next day, and you know, I come in to work, and all the guys are high fiving me and cheering me on, and some of the female waitresses were kind of stand opposite me and not really responding to my hellos. So I'm like, oh man, what did I do last night? This one dude walks up to me, he's like, man, I have never seen somebody drink wine like that in my life. So, you know, I, I know how I get, I'm all wound up. Many of you remember the keg stand days and the keg laps days and the play in the quarters days in the late 90s and early 2000s when it was still fun. And I could just imagine. I was probably pounding all these full glasses of wine and just getting heated, man. And I uh, you know, probably blacked out and was acting like a fool. And, uh, yeah, so I told them, I said, that won't be happening again. You know, so I must have been impressing them with the amounts of wine and how fast I was, you know, putting it down. I'll never know. I'll never know. So I got the training uh, at Applebee's. And, uh... It was like a weekend of the job, and it was the summertime, and uh, they had a massive hiring of all these Irish immigrants that were in uh, San Francisco for the summertime. Uh, they were mostly students, and I think they're doing studying abroad or something. So there were, there were lots of people had accents from from Ireland. It's kind of fun working with these young kids, and uh, so I was looking at, at an opportunity for me because I'm doing this grand opening again. Um, as many of you remember from uh, the last episode, we were talking about the grand opening of the Blue Line in uh, Burlingame. So I was like, okay, this is my chance to get in the door at a new restaurant, uh, maybe move my way up to management, get up the corporate ladder. And, uh, yeah, but I was so delusional because I still was not looking at my character change that needed to be done, needed to be made in order for me to have a serene life. 
or even a responsible human being. So uh, I thought it was going to be this great attribute and, uh, and a great piece of the puzzle for this company, and I was just like out of my mind. So, uh, yeah, I remember I was out drinking Steel Reserve one day on Mission Street, you know, and uh, I'm hanging out, and I, I fumbled into the Golden Bell Massage Parlor, and I met up with this, uh, this Thai lady. Uh, she was a masseuse, and she had uh, fake breast implants, and uh, hung out there for a little bit, and uh, her name was Cherry. And uh, so after I left there, I went fumbling down the street to get some pizza, and uh, I'm sitting, I'm sitting there, I'm eating a couple slices of pie on Mission Street, and there's just three guys sitting at, at this table across from me. They're kind of eyeballing me, right? And there's something really suspicious about these three cats. And uh, about an hour later, I decided to uh, go buy some more booze and then go into the adult video arcade down the street and look at some pornography in a booth. Obviously, I didn't learn my lesson from the one in San Mateo, Jaybird Books. So I remember I stood in line waiting to get in one of these booths, and those same three guys that are at the pizza parlor were all lined up on opposite sides of me at the other booths, right? So one guy leaves this booth, and I go in, and I lock myself in. I get my booze all set up. You know, I'm about to take my, drop my pants down and get all set up for my, my uh, you know. <laughs> what, a, what a sick man. Anyway, so not five, ten seconds after I get in the booth, I hear two doors slam on the other side. And all of a sudden, I look over, and there's these damn glory holes again in this booth. I'm seeing eyeballs and hands going through and all this. So I, I pack up, zip up, grab my, slam my booze down, whatever one I cracked open. I go back outside to the front. Uh, you know, I go to the front of the arcade. I ask the guy running the desk, I want my money back, you know, uh, due to the situation, and I left. I remember getting on the bus and uh, going further down Mission, just away from that whole scene, and there was countless drug-addicted, transvestite male hookers dressed in miniskirts uh, and blonde wigs all over uh, Mission Street down there uh, in that part of town. And uh, once again, I felt very out of place, and uh, it wasn't a good situation. And at this point, I really wanted out of San Francisco. It, it, it was just, it, it was over with, you know. And uh, I mean, I was anticipating trying to get into the uh, electricians union, uh, local six at this time. I'd taken some tests, I'd taken some classes prior. I think I told you in 2011, I, I, I went and I, I passed in San, uh, San Mateo County. So I make a call to my buddy, Nick Burroughs. Uh, you know, he's trying to help me out, refer me. Uh, my cousin Courtney's husband, Bobby Gomez, uh, the great Jeff Dean. You know, Jeff was really, you know, texting and calling me back and forth a little bit. We're, trying to get something going for me he's trying to refer me yeah you know, jeff always had my back and was rallying for me you know and what a great guy man i uh, really i really miss jeff you know nick b was always my boy and uh you know he he had my back he uh he was writing some letters and trying to pull some strings but uh anyway so i'm anticipating waiting to, to take this test but it was still a few months away and uh you know so i went to work one day and uh I remember I was inside of the the bar area at Applebee's, and my old manager Rudy Hernandez, who I spoke about uh, so highly of in, in 2012, he was there, and he was happy to see me working again, back on my feet. And he, you know, boy, did I have him fooled. I didn't have it together at all, man. I was full of shit. And uh, anyway, so I didn't really tell him what was happening, what was really happening, and uh, he didn't feel very good. I felt like a phony after he left. So I began co-parent counseling sessions that were ordered by the courts a couple years prior for me and Shauna to do. And I knew the counselor as he was a customer at the deli I worked at in Millbrae. Uh, his office was upstairs. So he also had an office in San Francisco was convenient. So I started, I went there and I went to my first session. And then uh, I, I remember a couple weeks later I went for my second session and I had been drinking prior to it. And he had suggested that we called the whole thing off and he's trying to help me out. And he felt bad about what, was, what I was going through with just everything going on. And uh, so let me stay at his place. And somehow, I guess earlier in the day, I'd lost my I'd lost my backpack with all my Applebee's, you know, equipment or whatever you want to call it, you know, apron and all that stuff. And um, I got an anonymous call from some some lady, and she said she found my backpack and my phone number was inside the workbook. And she I, I could have sworn she said she left it at the Redwood City location. So I got this guy to drive me down, I'll hold me down from San Francisco to Redwood City to go pick this stuff up so I can get back up to work. I called my boss at, at Applebee's. I told him I was going to be late. And uh, anyway, the stuff wasn't there at Redwood City. I felt terrible for the guy to drive me down there for nothing. And uh, I show up to work. 
I actually, I never made it to work. I never made it to work that day. It's a couple days later, I go in for my next shift. Bombed. I'm ripped, right? I go straight into the bathroom, and for some reason, I get this weird uh, idea to take some ibuprofen and crush it up and chop it up on the toilet and snort it. Like I was back in my old cocaine days or something. It was really a trip. I have no, I still to this day, I have no idea what I was, what I was thinking. So, um, I remember he, uh, oh man. so, uh, I, I felt, I, I felt a little bit better, uh, physically. I was losing weight cause I was working again, you know? And, um, you know, it, it just, things were just getting better. It was just getting, it was getting, it was getting worse because I remember I, 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 even though I was physically feeling better, I was still getting drunk. So I was on these long, long runs. I was, I was just kind of drinking here and there and I get messed up really fast and I'd sober up. So I remember one time I was, I, I got all hammered and I wanted to get detox. So I went to the hospital and I called my boss at the Rainforest Cafe and after numerous warnings of me calling out because of my drinking, he finally let me go. And, uh, I felt worthless at this point. I went on a bender one day and I was riding the bus all over San Francisco drinking. One late night, I ended up at the Daly City border. I was trying to get out of San Francisco and uh, I wanted to transfer from the Muni to Sam Trans. I, I wanted to get down to the clubhouse in San Carlos by the creek. I wanted to go to the group down there. And I wanted out of San Francisco completely. I was in the fog and it was freezing and I was wasted. And I was on the wrong side of the street and the Sam Trans bus leaves. I go, running down the street and there's a slope is good kind of slightly going downhill and the, the, the street was a little bit damp and I slipped and I fell face first nearly chipping my teeth and breaking my teeth out I slammed my collarbone into the into the uh, pavement and uh, it hurt I remember it was sore the next day and anyway so I'm, I'm just laying there stranded on this on the cement on Mission Street Daly City San Francisco border and uh, I, I was just looking for a place to lay that night so I got on another Muni train and I, I, I got off at like, the, I, was, I think I got to the K line where it ends on either Glen Park or uh, Balboa Park station. And I remember I went where all the trains were parked and it was quiet and I just felt safe. And it was very, it was actually a very dangerous location being in the trains. Just, you know, all, anyway, I'm laying there on the cement. And I'm just like, what am I going to do, man? I, I wanted it all then. I was just, I was like, this is not going to get better. I had no hope at all. I felt like the near. I, I felt like the end was very much near, and you know, I picked up the phone. It was really late. I called my mom, and I told her it was gone. I begged her to come get me. Thank God, her and Kevin. They, I, I gave them some address in San Francisco for them to meet me at, and they came down. They picked me up at like I don't know three in the morning. My mom woke me up. We got on the road at like eight o'clock. I got like three hours of sleep. She drove me all the way back down to Fisherman's Wharf so I could make it back to work at Applebee's, and. Uh, it was terrible, but they might have saved my life. You know, my poor mom, I was putting her through hell, and I was just so, I was just so upset with what was going on. And, you know, she was really upset. So, uh, yeah, yeah, so things like the, the whole ibuprofen on the toilet thing were happening. So remember, I show up to work later on that week, and uh, I was hammered, and I, I went in the bathroom again, and I went in the stall, and I can't remember if I was using the bathroom, what I was doing in the bathroom, I don't know what I was doing in the stall, I was probably drinking. But uh, I remember I woke up to my boss over the, 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 the top of the stall yelling at me, telling me to wake up. And I was laid out up against the wall, looking at the toilet paper holster, and I'm, I'm next to the toilet. And I, I wasn't vomiting or anything like that, but I was just laying there, just, just wiped out. So I was totally embarrassed again. You know, he goes, I don't know what's going on. You said you're coming to work the other day. You didn't show up to work with your stuff. You never showed, you didn't call. Now you show up, and you, you walk in, you seem fine. 45 minutes later, you're passed out in the bathroom. Anyway, so I decided to tell him the truth about what was going on with me, and uh, I never came back. You know, things were just getting worse and worse, man. You know, and it was all because I couldn't see that if I change my character, I can have a direct result on the outcomes of what's going on. Yes, we don't control other people. Yes, we don't control necessarily all the circumstances. But I don't have to make things worse if I have control of my character and my mind. And I was not there yet. I still need to go through all this humiliation. It was terrible. So 2013 was not off to a good start, you know. So now we're like into like August, September, and uh, it, it's getting really ugly. So you know, in a Mind Power Disease once again by Bob Anderson on page 61. He says, my world is the world I brought here from my drunken world, and it's the same world when I'm sober. It's no different. 
no different. And that's proven. But there's another world, God's world. God's world is a world that I want to live in. That was said very beautifully, and I can identify with it now because now I'm disciplined and I'm taking time out of my day to get my mind right. And all this other stuff is just an illusion. And, uh, you know, there's been th some things going on with some close friends of mine and my relationships. And, I, I, you know, I, they're going through things and they're thinking things that I've been through. And it's all disillusion, you know. We cannot make assumptions. Like it says in the Four Agreements, never assume. Because there is quite a good chance that we might be wrong. But I'm not going to preach all the literature. Everybody's on their own path, and everybody's got to find their own way into enlightenment. I'm just the messenger of, this is how I suffered. And if you don't want to suffer anymore, if you want a genuine smile like this, hey, there's some great books out there that can get you there. But don't lose the hope, because a sorry ass like me is feeling good now. And uh, today I'm prepared for when life does not go my way. Or go a way that I don't prefer. Anyway. That's all the time we have for this episode of the Dan Van Carroll Show. Thank you so much for tuning in for the last 26, 27 minutes. I know it's a long time to listen to me and look at this smirk. Hopefully uh, you've taken something out of this. And uh, check out 2013 Part 2 next time on the Dan Van Carroll Show, only on YouTube, Christmas with Crack Hookers. I'll see you next time. And here's the feeling good all the time. I just don't have a drink, too. Do a toast. <laughs>